I'm Ian, I am here today at the Rock Island Auction House, and one that they have here that's something cool that I probably should have looked at a long time ago here, but I didn't, is an authentic original Walker 1847 Colt pistol. Now, it's kind of interesting, Colt has been in the news recently for its most recent bankruptcy fiasco. Well, you know, Colt kind of started as a company with a bankruptcy fiasco. Uh, the 1836 Patterson was the first revolver that Sam Colt designed and manufactured. It was really the first uh, revolver on the commercial market here in the US. It was a fairly revolutionary firearm. Now, the, the revolver concept had existed before, but the Patterson was really an efficient and well-designed pistol for its time. It was the first practical revolver uh, for the civilian market. Unfortunately, it was still a bit fragile. They were a little bit underpowered. They weren't perfected. Um, and the Patterson didn't sell very well, and it actually pretty much drove Colt out of business. Uh, what rescued him ultimately was this guy, uh, going actually from kind of a small pistol to this massive, humongous chunk of pistol here. So what happened was a guy named uh, Sam Walker, Samuel Walker, uh, had been an officer in the U.S. Army, and he'd been fighting in Florida in the Seminole Wars, and had some experience with Patterson revolvers in combat. And while he recognized their flaws, their being a little delicate, maybe underpowered, at the same time, he also recognized that they gave you a massive increase in firepower over a single-shot pistol. Uh, for all their problems, he thought they were a gun with a huge amount of potential. And a few years later, when he found himself uh, serving in Texas, he actually wrote to Sam Colt to say, you know, hey, I like your Patterson revolver, but I really want to get, I have something bigger and better in mind, and I'm wondering if you could make me revolvers for a couple companies of U.S. mounted rifles. Uh, so these were guys who were basically cavalry of the era. Um, they had a little carbine, but they wanted, what Walker wanted was a couple of basically horse pistols uh, for each trooper. The idea being you would have a handgun, it would give you six rounds of capacity instead of the typical single shot from a muzzle-loading rifle or carbine. And he had this idea for a pistol that was powerful enough for a single shot to kill an enemy horse, or man, but especially a horse. So he wrote up all these specifications, sent them to Colt. Colt at this time was in serious financial trouble. And the idea of actually making a military contract was very appealing. Um, so. Colt went back and forth, the two of them collaborated, they came up with the design for what ultimately became the model of 1847 Walker revolver. Uh, and Colton, Colt himself referred to this as the Walker model gun after Samuel Walker, uh, who was the inspiration and the, the driving force behind it. Now, Colt actually got a contract for a thousand of these pistols from the US military. And interestingly, it started out as a thousand guns, each one issued with uh, loading tools and a powder flask. And then the contract was changed partway through production uh, with the idea that they would issue two guns to each soldier. So each soldier only needed one set of loading tools and powder flask and all of those accoutrements. So the, the profit margin for Colt actually dropped a bit as a result. He wasn't happy with that. But it was still a good contract. He ended up making a thousand guns for the military uh, to be issued in pairs to 500 troopers. Uh, that was 200 per company. So these went to uh, companies A, B, C, and A, B, C, D, and E uh, of the U.S. mounted rifles. For the, mo for the record, com uh, company C was Walker's company. And he also made 100 extra guns for commercial sale. So a total of 1,100 of these pistols were originally produced. Now, let's come back in here a little closer and take a, a, an up-close look at this thing because this is an absolutely ludicrously massive pistol and it's really worth a closer look. All right, so the Walker here is actually bigger than my camera frame, so let me zoom out a bit. A little more, there we go. So this was actually the most powerful revolver on the market until the introduction of the 357 Magnum uh, in the 1950s, believe it or not. Um, it has a nine inch barrel on it, a huge cylinder. The whole gun weighs about four and a half pounds, a little more than four and a half pounds actually. And it will take a powder charge of up to 60 grains of black powder, which is pretty much the same charge you'd put in a rifle. Now it's not quite gonna have the same ballistics as a rifle because it does have a cylinder gap and it does have a much shorter barrel. But 
on a, just on a scale of, of zero to massive, this thing is massive. Now, uh, they were made out of iron with a brass trigger guard here. There were a couple problems with these guns, actually. Uh, for one thing, the loading lever here, which you use to ram powder and projectile, the loading levers are retained by this little spring inside this little catch in the loading lever, and that wasn't sufficient. Uh, it didn't take very long for that spring to get bent or to lose its tension, and these guns had a tendency, every time you pull the trigger, for the loading lever to get jarred down like that. So then you'd have to put it back up. Um, troopers actually would sometimes tie these up with thongs of leather, or some of them were modified later to have uh, improved uh, Colt Dragoon style uh, latches. This was a feature that Colt uh, significantly improved in later versions of the revolver. At any rate, that was one of the issues. One of the other problems was that these actually had a tendency to explode during use uh, for a couple reasons. First off, remember this is the 1840s. The metallurgy going into these guns isn't all that great, certainly not by today's standards, and they're holding a massive powder charge. Now, that's part of the issue. Another part of the issue, uh, something that doesn't get talked about very much, is that these guns were originally actually issued uh, to be used with what were called picket bullets, which is this conical, very sharply pointed projectile. Um, if you think of a piece of candy corn or a traffic cone, that's kind of the shape of the bullet that was designed to be used in the walker. Now that bullet had a couple of advantages. Because it was sharply pointed, it actually had very little contact area with the cylinder or the barrel, which meant that you'd, uh, you wouldn't develop quite as high a pressure. The bullet could accelerate fairly quickly once the powder detonated or burned. The problem was a lot of the troopers using these revolvers, these were literally the first revolvers that they'd ever seen. This was new technology to them. And when they got their hands on these bullets, if you try and load it point first, it's very easy for this bullet to, to tip to one side or the other. And that'll totally destroy your accuracy. If they're loaded properly and they're all square and, and aligned with the bore, they can be very accurate bullets. But when they start tipping different directions when you're loading them, that all goes out the window. So between that and inexperience, some of, these, some of the troopers took these bullets and actually loaded them backwards with the point pointing back towards the shooter and the flat surface going out the barrel. That's a lot easier to load effectively and consistently. The problem is that actually leaves significantly more room in the cylinder for a powder charge. And what these guys would tend to do is, you know, they weren't going around with exact powder measures. They'd fill up the cylinder. And if you fill up the cylinder with the bullet pointed backwards, that's more powder and more pressure than the gun was designed to handle. And that was definitely a contributing factor uh, for why so many of these guns exploded. Uh, it, it turned out to be about a third of them that went into military issue were returned to Colt for repair for one reason or another. So these guns were initially delivered to the military in 1848. Uh, Walker himself was uh, campaigning down in Mexico when he finally got his pair of the revolvers. Uh, he actually died in 1848 with, with a pair of these revolvers on him. Uh, they saw service, about half of them saw service in active service in Mexico. And then they came back and uh, continued to see service with the Texas Rangers. These guns were in pretty much constant use from when they were originally manufactured through, well, through at least the end of the Civil War. Because when the Civil War broke out, the Walker revolvers that were still in Texas were uh, snapped up by the Confederate Army, and a lot of them saw service uh, in the Civil War in Confederate hands. And of course, you know, these were early high-tech revolvers. They were highly desirable by anyone who was looking for firearms. And these guns tended to just get used and used and used to the point of becoming completely irreparable. So only about 10 to 15% of the original production are still known to exist in collectors' hands today. And a lot of those show significant wear or replaced parts. Uh, it's not, common, not uncommon for the wedges to be replaced, uh, screws sometimes. In this case, the loading lever here is actually a modern replacement which probably explains why this uh, spring is in quite good shape and seems like it'd be pretty effective. Uh, so yeah, sometimes you'll get replacement levers. Uh, sometimes you'll also find the levers to have been modified to the style of the later Colt Dragoons. 
in this case, uh, all of the markings had worn off this pistol. In fact, you can see the cylinder looks smooth. Originally, Colt actually roll stamped all of his cylinders with this battle scene of Indians and Texas Rangers. And that wasn't purely for decorative reasons, that was actually sort of a, a mark of authenticity. Colt hired a guy who was actually a professional, a well-known professional engraver who had experience engraving uh, the stamping machinery for banknotes. And he had uh, these, these battle scenes engraved for his revolvers because that was something really difficult for a, a low-end competitor to duplicate. So if you saw this nicely press engraved battle scene on the cylinder of your revolver, you could be confident that you were getting a genuine Colt. Now, on this one, this pistol has been used so heavily that this, the scene is completely gone. It's worn off. Uh, on the walkers, that engraving or that stamping, roll stamping, was fairly light in the first place. And it's not at all uncommon to have it completely or partially worn off on these guns today. However, the markings on the gun have actually been recut so that they're all legible. Um, and it's interesting, normally you would expect a unit mark on a pistol to be something that was done kind of ad hoc by a unit armorer. In the case of the Walkers, these unit marks are actually made by the Colt factory. And so they will designate the company and the gun number somewhere between 1 and 200. So this guy is uh, number, revolver number 126 from A Company. And that is going to be marked in a bunch of places on the pistol, kind of like you would expect with a factory serial number. So it's up here, it's on the frame, it is actually in very small lettering here on the trigger guard. You'll find it here on the bottom of the grip, upside down. But. And then you also have a US and an 1847 kind of under the screw on the wedge right there. So. That unit marking is atypical for guns in general, but that's actually how the walkers were done. And like I said, on this one, those unit marks have been re-engraved so that they're legible today. Um, originally, they had been completely worn down, just like the cylinder scene. The one other bit of marking that you'll have on these is on the top of the, the barrel flat, where it says, Address Samuel Colt, New York City. We don't get much gun manufacture in New York City these days, but you used to. So ultimately, uh, the Walker was not produced in particularly large numbers. Only, like I said, only 1,100 of them were made initially. But these would go on to financially resurrect the Colt company. Uh, he, these became popular. They became very well known, especially their association with Texas Rangers. And later guns would start to address some of the, the, the issues that made this a bit of an impractical gun. Uh, frankly, it was so heavy that it really it worked well on a uh, holsters mounted to a saddle, not a very good belt gun, just, again, ludicrously heavy. So the next pattern guns Colt would make would be the Dragoons, which would have shorter barrels, they would have shorter cylinders with slightly lower powder charges, um, especially in 44 caliber. These were still powerful guns, but not, not to the over-the-top level of the Walkers. And from there, the guns evolved into the 1851 Navy and the 1860 Army, which were some of the, the most common and most popular percussion revolvers ever made. The Volcanic goes back, we can go back a little bit before this, although we don't have a gun to exemplify it. Um, a man named Walter Hunt developed a concept called the rocket ball ammunition, a rocket ball cartridge, sort of. Not really a cartridge, what he came up with was this idea that if you took a, a relatively long lead bullet and you hollowed out the base of the bullet, you could then fill that hollow base with gunpowder and put on a, some sort of fulminate primer, and you could have a self-contained cartridge. One of the big advantages of this was, in addition to being self-contained and you know, easy to transport, it was also relatively waterproof, unlike carrying loose powder or a paper cartridge. So this was before the advent of the self-contained metallic cartridge, before the use of brass cartridge cases widely. Um, Hunt came up with this idea, and he came up with a lever action, more or less, uh, firearm, rifle, to fire it, which he called the Volition Repeater. Now, this, the Volition Repeater was never manufactured in quantity, uh, may never have been manufactured at all, um, but what's relevant about it is that his idea was noticed by some other people, and his patents were purchased, the rights to use his idea, 
were purchased by two guys named Daniel Wesson and Horace Smith. Smith and Wesson, they are in fact that Smith and Wesson. And they started, they, they tried to develop this rocket ball ammunition into something marketable. Um, a few fits and starts, they ended up reincorporating their company as the Volcanic Repeating Arms Company. This was in 1855, and at that point they actually had a model, a firearm to manufacture, and they went into production. Um, they actually had two, two versions. They had a pistol version and a rifle version. This is one of the rifle versions. Uh, they made them in several different barrel lengths, and this was really the first modern version of what we know today as the lever action rifle, the, the classic, iconic, American Old West lever action rifle. The first one was the Volcanic. Uh, these were manufactured uh, up in Connecticut. Originally the factory was in Norwich, Connecticut. Now there were some problems with this rifle, uh, mostly problems with its ammunition. Uh, for one thing, it, you tended to have a lot of gas leakage at the breech because there was no brass case that would expand on firing and seal all the gases in the breech of the rifle. Instead you just had this hollow base lead bullet. Well the seal between the bolt and the back of the barrel wasn't all that great so they leaked some gas. Um, and maybe more importantly the cartridge was really, really wimpy. Um, it fired a 106 grain bullet, uh, and by the way this is the 41 caliber version. The rifles were typically in 41, the pistols were in 31. Uh, the 41 caliber rifles fired a 106 grain bullet at 5 to 600 feet per second. And that's pretty paltry. Um, it's a, a light bullet and it's going pretty darn slow. So that was probably a bigger issue than, than problems uh, with the, the rifle design. So after just a couple of years, the Volcanic Arms Company was in really not in good financial shape. They were in trouble. They, they had a hard time making money. The guns weren't selling very well. And one after the other, Smith and Wesson both ended up leaving the company. They went back to Smith and Wesson, their own initial company, uh, and they ended up purchasing a patent from a guy named Rollin White, who had patented the concept of drilling a chamber clear through a revolver cylinder from front to back. And Smith and Wesson would go on to really exploit this patent and corner the market in modern revolvers using what was becoming the, the new available technology of self-contained metallic cartridges. And they would end up to do, going on to do very well in that market. Obviously Smith and Wesson is still around today. It's the same, the company comes from that same company. Well, when the Volcanic Arms Company was first incorporated back in 1855, one of the main, one of the bigger investors was a kind of wealthy guy by the name of Oliver Winchester. And when Smith and Wesson were leaving, Winchester pretty much took over the company financially. He moved the factory down to New Haven, Connecticut, uh, reincorporated it as the New Haven Arms Company, and the guy he put in charge of, of the factory was a guy named Benjamin Taylor Henry, whose name may sound familiar. Um, Henry had been an engineer involved in the design of these rifles uh, for quite some time, and he continued to work on them, and he improved them to the point that um, in 1860, the New Haven Arms Company started producing not the Volcanic, but instead the 1860 Henry rifle. Which I happen to have an example of right here. So the advantage of the Henry was that it now used rimfire ammunition. Instead of these really pathetically wimpy rocket balls, they had a longer, uh, larger projectile moving much faster, uh, the 44 rimfire Henry cartridge. So uh, this specifically fired a 200 grain bullet at about 1125 feet per second. So literally double the bullet weight, well almost double the bullet weight, and double the velocity of the, the volcanic rocket ball. Much more powerful rifle. And you can see that when you compare the two guns side by side, just the sheer size difference. Look at the receivers of these two guns how much bigger, how much more material there is in Henry. That's because it had a lot more pressure to deal with, it had a much more powerful cartridge. So the rim fire ammunition used in Henry had another advantage, that being it wasn't caseless ammunition. Caseless ammo has always, back when it was the volcanic and today with modern experiments, it always has kind of a couple of similar problems, and one of those is what happens if a round doesn't fire, if you have some sort of malfunction? Well, the volcanic, had no extractor because there was no case to pull out of the, the chamber after you were firing. There was no mechanism to pull anything backwards. So 
if you had a dud round, you had to open the lever up and then get a cleaning rod and try and ram the, the dud, dud round out the back of the barrel. It was kind of a mess. If you had a dud, you're in, in trouble until you can deal with the gun. Well, by switching to modern cased rimfire ammunition, the Henry added extractors to its bolt. So now after you fired, you would extract the empty case, which meant if you had a dud round, you could extract it as well, just like an empty case. Um, the brass case also alleviated all of the gas sealing issues, because now you had that brass to expand and create a gas seal. Um, the Henry was a, in general, a, a more practical gun. It was heavier, it was more durable, it fired a more powerful cartridge, and it proved to be immensely popular. Now, one of the issues with the Henry was it didn't have a handguard. Now, the Volcanic hadn't either, but on the Henry you've got this, this tab here is your magazine follower, and so in addition to the barrel getting hot as you fire, because I mean the, the magazine capacity on these was significant. Uh, with the Volcanic, depending on barrel length, you could hold between 20 and 30 cartridges in the tube. Um, the Henry cartridge was a bit longer, uh, so capacity was reduced, but you're still talking easily 16 rounds in the tube. That'll get this, this barrel hot, 16 rounds of black powder. So you're kind of missing a bit of a handguard here. And then in addition, this magazine follower is moving backwards every time you load a new cartridge. And at a certain point, it's going to hit your hand, your support hand, like this. And if you don't recognize that, if you hold your hand here and stop the magazine follower, you no longer have spring tension pushing cartridges down the magazine. And you'll start cycling the gun and you won't get any new cartridges. You have to remember to do what is in cowboy action circles today called the Henry hop, where you pull your hand, you know, the, as the follower approaches, you pull your hand from here, hop it out in front of the follower uh, so that you don't obstruct this guy. At any rate, this, this was a, a liability of the Henry. Um, you also had a rather awkward loading mechanism where you had to bring the follower all the way up to this, you know what, I'm going to leave this spring alone. You would bring the follower all the way up here, and then the front half of the barrel and magazine tube, the front half of the magazine tube, actually rotates 45 degrees, and you load it from the front, kind of like a tube-fed 22 today. And that was a bit awkward. So the New Haven Arms Company is continuing to work on modernizing and improving this rifle, and in 1866 they renamed themselves again and they now name themselves the Winchester Repeating Arms Company. Oliver Winchester is owner and thoroughly in control of the company, and in 1866 they came out with their next rather groundbreaking new development in firearms, that being the 1866 Winchester rifle. This includes two primary improvements. Now it's still chambered in 44 Henry rimfire, uh, which is still a pretty reasonable cartridge. It is pretty darn close. It's just slightly less powerful than the 4440 uh, cartridge which would follow in 1873. Um, yeah, the 44 Henry was, was a perfectly adequate pistol cartridge. Now what the 66 Winchester um, improved on was, first off, we have a handguard here, so you now have, you don't have to worry about the barrel heating up too much. They also significantly changed the loading and the magazine structure. So instead of having to load from the front of the magazine tube, you now have a loading gate, patented by a guy named King, and all you have to do is you can thumb cartridges in from the back of the magazine tube. And once we get to this point, now we basically have the modern Old West lever gun. Well, the, the fully realized Old West lever gun, shall we say. So we normally think of these rifles and carbines as being chambered for cartridges like um, the 45 Colt. That's not historically accurate. The 45 Colt hadn't been invented when this, car when this carbine was developed. Um, the reason we have that association is because of the popularity of things like cowboy action shooting, which has led to uh, the marketing of reproductions of guns like the 66 Winchester in more modern cartridges that are relatively easy for people to shoot today. The problem with 44 Henry is it's a rimfire cartridge. Uh, nobody has made it in many decades. Original ammo is very scarce. And uh, rimfire cartridges just, people aren't really interested in them today. They'd rather have a reloadable cartridge. And a centerfire round like 45 Colt 
uh, makes a good fit for a rifle like this if you're making reproductions today. So that's what most of them are in, and that's why people kind of assume that these rifles would have originally been used with those cartridges, which they weren't. Um, the brass that you see here is actually uh, a material called gunmetal. It was an early bronze alloy. Um, it has a couple of advantages over steel. It's easier to machine, it doesn't rust, um, it looks cool. This is what gave some of these guns uh, the nickname Yellow Boys. Uh, had nothing to do with racism, it was because they had rather brilliant yellow receivers. So they, they kind of acquired that name easily and automatically. I think that is pretty much going to cover the level of history I wanted to get into today. Um, after the 66 there was a whole progression of, of further uh, lever action rifles. Uh, just with Winchester there would be the 73, the 76, uh, the 95, the 85, or 86, uh, the 94, the 92, and that's not counting the other companies like Marlin and Burgess that were also making lever action rifles. So we'll get into some of those um, in the future, some soon, some later, but I thought it would be cool to take a look at uh, these kind of iconic early examples right now, all in one batch. I am taking a look today at the Lamat grape shot revolvers. Finding one of these is pretty cool. They're fantastic, really interesting guns. They're a neat concept, they're neat mechanically, they have this cool Civil War uh, Confederacy legacy to them. Uh, one is cool, two is really cool, five is a really outstanding opportunity to look at some of the differences between them. So I have done some previous videos on these guns and I'm going to let those stand and if you're interested in the history I would refer you to those videos. What I want to do today is take a look at the variety of the guns that we have here today. So what we have here are first off a, a very early Belgian made, basically a pre-production prototype. Uh, very cool to look at, very few of these still exist. So definitely we'll, we'll take a look at the features of that one. And then we have two that are early first model guns, uh, serial number 8 and serial number 88. And uh, even cooler, these are both actually known provenance property of Confederate generals, so that's a neat added feature. And then we have two more that are much later guns, and these would be, um, they're considered second pattern Lamat revolvers, and one's in the middle, and one's very late. So we'll take a look at those as well, and what we can do is trace the progression of how this design changed over time, which is pretty cool and something we don't normally get to do because Lamat revolvers are so rare and expensive these days. So let's get right to it. All right, we'll start with this, the very early gun. So this was made in Belgium by a guy named August Francot, uh, who was a major manufacturer of firearms at the time. Uh, if we look up close, you can see a crown over an AF. That's a Francot mark. And there are a couple of those elsewhere on the gun as well. Um, yeah. We can also see right here on the cylinder an ELG in an oval. That is a Belgian proof house proof mark. So. The reason for this was that Lamont was looking for manufacturers in Europe to build his pistols. He had a couple of prototypes made in the United States, and it would appear that those were used as a model for a number of additional guns to be made by Frank Hott. These probably would have been used as samples <coughs> when visiting other potential contract manufacturers to show them, look, here's what we want you to produce. Uh, this one is actually serial numbered 16, although it's serial numbered on internal areas where I can't easily show you the numbers, uh, underside of the barrel, back face of the cylinder, that sort of thing. Um, and this is one that I don't really want to take apart. Um, a couple of things to point out. So the, the lockup between the barrel and the frame here is this type of joint, which will change very quickly on the production guns. You'll also notice it has a hammer that is shaped very much like a traditional revolver hammer. So it's a very high spur, a bit narrow, uh, checkered, you know, run it like that. And there is no mechanism to help you lower uh, the hammer face here. So what you do, I should point this out for people who aren't familiar with the Lamat, you have a nine round revolver cylinder, and these were typically 42 caliber, and then you have a central shotgun bore uh, that acts as the cylinder axis. And 
this would typically be 18 gauge. Now, in order to change to fire between the two, you put percussion caps on all of them, and when the hammer is in this position, it will fire the cylinders, or the chambers, all in succession. And then you can pivot the hammer face down like this, and then when you fire it, that hammer face will land on this central percussion cap, which fires the shotgun bore. So, on this early Belgian-made gun, you, you kind of have to grab it and wiggle it down. Yeah, it's not hard, but you can see how that might be troublesome in combat if your hands were cold or gloved or wet or muddy or anything like that. So, uh, there are a number of brass features on this pistol. The lanyard ring down here is a fixed large brass piece. Trigger guard is brass. You'll notice that we have a ramrod on the right side of the gun. Now, to use this, it has a little snap hook up here, and then you pull it back like so. So to use the ramrod, you line up a cylinder, a chamber, with the rammer, put in your powder, seat your ball, and then ram it like so. Now, you also have this shotgun bore, and you've got to have a way to deal with that. So what they did was they built a second ramrod in as this lever. So if I take the end here and unthread it slightly, I can then pull out an additional ramrod, and I would use this to manually pack a charge into the shotgun barrel. And then when I'm done, this screws right back in so that you don't lose it. And when you're not using it, this whole thing latches up nice and securely right there. All right, so now let's take a look at how, how things changed between these early samples and the first series, the first production series of Revolver. All right, I have now added serial number eight of the production Lamont. This is, in fact, the personal, ver pretty well documented property of General Beauregard, one of the really particularly famous Southern generals. Now, a lot of things stayed the same. You can see the, the ramrod lever is basically identical. Um, one major change was the trigger guard. Uh, a spur was added. So this is you know, kind of like you'd see later on a Smith & Wesson number three. Uh, you've got an extra finger hold down there. So, like this. Not a particularly comfortable way to hold the gun, in my opinion, but obviously uh, that was the trend of the time. The other major change you'll see visually is the shape of the hammer. So the early guns had this very high, kind of typical revolver hammer, but that's not easy to grasp from a firing grip. In fact, it's, you can't really grasp it from a firing grip. The first pattern of production Lamats did change that. So you've got this much wider, checkered, uh, and lower paddle that is graspable from a firing grip. Uh, definitely a big improvement. This made the gun handle quite a bit better. Um, a slightly less significant change is down here on the butt of the gun. We have a swiveling lanyard ring as opposed to this fixed loop. So that's indicative of the first pattern of guns. Now in total, uh, this pattern, uh, a total of 8,000 were initially ordered. Uh, 5,000 for the Confederate Army and another 3,000 for the Confederate Navy. That order would never fully materialize, uh, but that's what was initially placed. All right, now we have two of these. I have added serial number 88 down here. This was the property of Confederate General John Lawson Lewis. Uh, not quite as notable of a general as Beauregard. Um, I don't think there are any Confederate generals quite as notable as Beauregard, or not many. Um, however, these are both first pattern guns. Now, one might look at this and go, you know, man, what are the, what are the chances of having two general, Confederate general-owned Lamat revolvers like this. Well, there's actually a reason that this sort of thing happened. Lamat was not a fool. Um, he was a pretty savvy businessman. And he made a bit of a habit of giving Lamat revolvers to influential people in military circles in the hopes that it would help him get contracts. And I think, by and large, it did. Um, Beauregard was an ordnance officer at the time. Uh, Beauregard was also a partner with Lamat. So, Find, there are a couple other documented generals' pistols. Uh, in fact, Stonewall Jackson had one, which we should point out, the location is unknown. It is still out there waiting to be found or possibly destroyed. But um, So here we have a couple of 
uh, first pattern guns. Now, I'm going to take a closer look at Lawson's because there's another feature that I want to show you here, and that is this lever. Now, the way the Lamat is assembled, the shotgun barrel is threaded right out here under this ring, and the shotgun barrel just passes through this uh, center section here, and to disassemble one, what you do is you have to unlock the barrel from the frame, which on these first pattern guns you do simply by pressing down this lever, and then the whole barrel assembly unthreads. So if I press that lever down, I can then unscrew unscrew the barrel assembly, the cylinder comes right off, and there's the frame. So that's how these disassemble. And on these early guns, so on these early guns, that was the, the barrels were locked in place by this spring-loaded catch. And that was kind of an expensive part to manufacture. You know, obviously, it's a separate piece. You have to make sure that the catch lines up well um, with this machined notch in the frame. So, as you'll see in a minute, that's something that will change. Um, also, just to point out, you will see these grooves. These are not uh, threading. This is actually just a series of grooves for black powder fouling to sit in. That helps ensure that the cylinder continues to rotate smoothly even when it is fouled. It gives the, the fouling a place to go until you clean the gun and get rid of it. All right, now in total, by the way, we're back to Beauregard's pistol here, and then we have a second model gun. Uh, this particular one is serial number 1329. Now, in total, there were about 450 of these first model guns made. Um, I think the latest serial number known to exist still is 458. And then there were about 1,500 or 14, about 1,500 of these second pattern guns made. So these, the serial numbers, start about 1,000 and go to about 2,500. You may have noticed there's a space missing there. Um, from about 450 to about 1,000 were actually English-made pistols, which, unfortunately, I don't have an example of here today. So let's take a look at the first model to the second model. By the way, these were all made in France, uh, in Paris, in fact, although it's suspected that a lot of the components were actually contracted from Belgium. You will find some Belgian proof marks and some Belgian makers insignias on some of the parts. However, the gun as a whole was contracted out of Paris. Now, a lot of stuff changed between the first and second model, um, primarily related to manufacturing tolerances or manufacturing capacity. So, um, let's see, first off, some of the, the simple things. The lanyard ring on the butt of the revolver. On the first pattern, it swivels. On the late pattern, we got rid of that. We'll just make it a fixed solid loop on the end of the, the butt cap. That's simpler to make. The spur on the trigger guard is gone. We're now down to a smooth trigger guard, which frankly, I think is an improvement anyway. And one of the most significant changes is the lever. Well, let me get to that in a moment. Uh, the ramrod has gone from the right side to the left side of the pistol. And now, instead of pivoting down, it pivots up. So you now line up a cylinder, a chamber at the top, and pivot this ramrod up to use it. You still have a shotgun rod in there. It's no longer threaded at the end. It's now just a press fit. You can see, if we look closely here, there is a hole and a slot cut in the end of this rod, and then it's crimped so that it actually puts tension on this additional shotgun rod to hold it in place so it won't come out. There we go. And then that still snaps into place. So the lever, the loading lever changed sides. The disassembly lever also changed significantly. So on the first model guns, it's this spring-loaded lever that you push in. On the later pattern guns, they changed from that lever to this plug. It's a lot simpler. You just pull it out. And from a manufacturing point of view, all you have to do is line up these two pieces and then drill a hole through them, and you're done. Definitely easier than uh, making a square notch that has to line up with that lever. Remember, this is a critical position to make sure that the chamber is lined up with the barrel when you're ready to fire. So that's important for more than just disassembly. So this first pattern, 
uh, did improve your ability to reposition that hammer face by adding these two little wings to the side. So that helps. It's now easier to grab onto those and push that down. However, the second pattern did it. They, they finally came up with a way that really makes it easy, and that's to add this uh, lever on the back end. So all you have to do is flip that up. Simple, easy, definitely a, uh, a sequential series of improvements. All right, I want to show you the progression of markings. On the Belgian prototype gun, there's nothing on the top of the barrel. On Beauregard's gun, which is number six, we have Colonel Lamatte's patent, this nice fancy engraving right there. Then, by only number 88, so 80 guns later, that style has changed. It still says Colonel Lamatte's patent, but now we have a different different style to it. Let's see if we can get them both. There we go. So we've gone from a kind of blocky script to a, a much fancier script. Then on the second pattern guns, this will change further. So this is an early second pattern gun. You'll see it is now marked Colonel Lamatte. Uh, BTE is brevet, which is patent. SGDG, which is uh, kind of a bureaucratic standard patent abbreviation in French and Paris. So these guns were patented in the United States, Belgium, France, and the United Kingdom, as well as, I believe, both Prussia and Württemberg. Uh, so Lamette went out of his way to patent these everywhere to make sure that no one was going to copy his design. So on the second pattern guns, you'll find this script. This lasted until right about serial number 2000. At that point, it changed again. And our final version, Is, so at that point, it changed again, and our final version is this, much more simplistic. Um, it still says the same thing, but now in a totally different script, it is System Lamotte, BTE again, Brevet. And how it's kind of funny is on about half of these guns, they actually misspelled it. It should say SGDG, and it actually says SCDG, Paris. Um, no explanation known for why the misspelling. I think just someone messed up. So... Uh, this particular gun is serial number 2473. See there? So this is considered a late pattern second model gun. All right, so there was a problem with Lamat. Um, this was getting complaints, uh, especially as the quality started to dip a little bit in manufacture. Um, these problems became a little more apparent. And the problem was with the specific lockup mechanism of the gun. So let's take a closer look. Up through about serial number 2000, and including all of the prototypes, uh, the way the Lamat worked was you'd have a hand that pushed on this ratchet to rotate the cylinder, and then the, the cylinder stop was a pin that would protrude, push straight out into one of these holes to lock the cylinder in position. So here we have, you can see the pin right there. As I pull the hammer back, that retracts, and then here's our hand to move the cylinder. That's fine, it works, but it requires a high degree of precision to make sure that that pin lines up perfectly with the holes in the cylinder. And that wasn't working very well. So Lamatt came up with a way to fix this. Uh, he replaced the pin system with a spring-loaded wedge. So you can see we have a wedge here, and then our hand is there. So again, when I cock the gun, the wedge pulls down out of, out of interaction with the cylinder, allows the hand to rotate the cylinder, and then locks back in place. This was a much simpler system. Uh, it was easier to machine, and it was easier to keep it very closely in tolerance um, to keep the, the barrel and the cylinder lined up properly. So on these later cylinders, you can see that in between the ratchet steps, you have little square cutouts, and that's where the wedge goes. The pinholes around the, the circumference here are gone. So that change takes place at about serial number 2000. Interestingly, it is approximately uh, the same place where the, the uh, marking system changes to this very simple blocky text. So that's not a perfect correlation, but it's pretty darn close. Now, not very many of these got in. Like I said, it was about 2000, so only about 500 of these guns, less than 500 in fact, made it in out of a total of about 2,500 that were manufactured uh, and sent to the Confederacy. 
However, it's a very interesting change in how the Lamat worked and clear evidence that Lamat was continuing to improve his design and, and try and figure out how to make it better over the course of production. So externally, you can't really tell the difference easily between a pin gun like this one and a, a wedge gun like this one. However, there is a clue. On the pin guns, you have this extra little spring here, which is not on the wedge guns. This had to do with the tensioning spring for the pin. So that wasn't necessary. That is a way to visually identify between the two types, in addition to the markings on the top of the barrel and the serial numbers. So there you have them from the earliest tier, pre-production, our two first pattern guns, General Beauregard's and General Lawson's, and then our early second pattern and our late second pattern. The only one missing here is an example of the English manufacturer. This rifle was developed by a guy named Warren Evans. He lived up in Maine, and his initial design for this gun was in 1873. Uh, interestingly, this is, until Bushmaster moved to Maine fairly recently, uh, this was the only firearm mass produced in the state of Maine. Interesting little bit of trivia there. At any rate, what Evans came up with was a very interesting magazine system that he paired up with a gun design. Now the whole rear end of this gun, the buttstock and everything, is built around a tube about an inch and a half in diameter that contains a long helical magazine. Now the original old model guns, uh, could, using this magazine, would hold no less than 34 cartridges. And this wasn't a little pipsqueak of a cartridge either. These guns were developed around a proprietary cartridge that Evans also designed, the 44 Evans Short. Uh, and in the original configuration, this was about a one inch long cartridge case, about 25 millimeters. It fired a 220 grain bullet at about 850 feet per second. So that's almost identical to 45 ACP today. Now, Evans went ahead and built these guns, and he made them in a variety of configurations. You could get all sorts of different barrel lengths, uh, finishes, different finishes were available, and they were made in both military and civilian patterns. So you might have a wood stock going all the way to the muzzle, you might have a bayonet lug, or you might have something like this with a short barrel and a sporter style fancy stock. The old model guns he manufactured from 1874 until 1876 and didn't make very many, probably only about 500. Um, this was kind of the introductory period for the Evans rifle. Uh, he was able to get some of the guns out there, get some reports back from them, and one of the main complaints was that the cartridge was underpowered. People wanted something with a little bit more oomph to it. So with this feedback in mind, in 1877, he starts producing a new model of Evans carbine, or rifle, depending on which you ordered. Uh, this was instead based around the 44 Evans long cartridge. Uh, this was about an inch and a half cartridge, uh, brass case, so about 50% longer. Uh, in metric you'd be looking at 38, 39, 40 millimeters, something in there. And this boosted the performance to firing about a 300 grain bullet at about 1200 feet per second. So this is getting into much more substantial uh, territory. That At that point you're looking at something roughly equivalent to the Spencer carbine. So you went basically from a Henry equivalent cartridge to a Spencer equivalent cartridge. And that's, that's a reasonable increase in potency. Now, because this cartridge was longer, it reduced the magazine capacity. The new model Evans could only hold 28 rounds. Now, I believe that was 26 in the magazine tube, and then you could actually get two more into the action in the chamber, um, kind of like you know, uh, adding one to the chamber of a regular lever action rifle. So capacity of 26 to 28 in the new model gun. However, it was a significantly more potent round, and people liked it. In fact, they liked it quite a lot. Um, they were only in production until 1879, so only three years of production here, but he still managed to produce between 12 and 15,000 rifles, uh, depending on which sources you read. They were fairly popular in the US. They were also sold in significant numbers in South America. Uh, interestingly, one of the major investors in Evans Rifle Company, the Evans Repeating Rifle Company, was actually the Merwin and Hulbert Company, who were a manufacturer of actually probably the best Old West pattern revolver ever designed. Uh, they had taken a lot of their capital and put it into the Evans Company in hopes of making a really nice return. They thought this rifle had a lot of potential. Uh, and they did some of the marketing and sales for them. So it was apparently largely through Merwin and Hulbert that a lot of the Evans rifles were sold in South America. Uh, they were also examined by a number of continental powers, 
with an eye towards potential military use. Uh, apparently both Russia and Turkey bought uh, quantities of these guns. They were tested by the U.S. military. Uh, the U.S. military, the course, at the time, of course, was still working with the single-shot trapdoor Springfield. Uh, they put this through a dust test, which it failed. Uh, it wasn't reliable enough for them. And there are going to be some issues with the loading and the firepower, which we'll get to in a minute. At any rate, the U.S. military declined these rifles. Um, the problem here really was Evans was competing against Winchester, which had a, a huge advantage in the marketplace. They were very popular. They were well known. Evans managed to get some impressive tutorials. Uh, there were guys like Kit Carson and Buffalo Bill Cody who used these rifles. Now, potentially, they simply used them because they were paid to use them and endorse them. But regardless, the Evans company got some really nice testimonials uh, as a result. But it just wasn't enough for them to overcome the competition with the Winchester company, primarily. And this was a small company, they, and they, it was basically an inability to efficiently organize a manufacturing plant and set up for large-scale manufacturing that did them in. Uh, by 1879, the company was going bankrupt. Um, interestingly, they actually pulled down the Merwin and Holbert company at the same time. Uh, the loss of the Evans company uh, put such a, a hurt on Merwin's finances that they were ultimately driven out of business at the same time. Uh, by 1881, all of uh, the Evans company tooling and production stock had been auctioned off, and it was gone. Uh, Warren Evans himself uh, went back to his career in dentistry and continued to invent things. He patented some other designs for dental application technology and ultimately lived until 1912, apparently. So he had a, an impressive run at it. Wasn't, and, and you know what, 12,000 to 15,000 rifles, that's pretty substantial. It may be ultimately a failure in the marketplace, but that's an impressive try. There are a lot of guys who are designing guns out there who didn't get anywhere near the success that Warren Evans did. So why don't we go ahead and take a closer look at this because there's some really interesting details to how you have to feed and operate this gun because it does have this very unique magazine system. So here's the issue with the helical magazine. What you have is a hollow cylinder here. It goes all the way down to the butt plate and it has a spiral track running in it, and that track is, uh, controls the front and the back of the cartridge. So that, that spiral track allows cartridges to uh, spiral their way up this tube. Now in the center of the tube, you have a cross-shaped follower. So you can see it right here. And every time you run the lever, you rotate that follower by 90 degrees, or a quarter of a turn. What this does is it means that each cartridge, you'll have four columns of cartridges, one in each corner of this follower, and they're all stuck on this uh, spiral track. So each time that you rotate the follower, you're pushing each cartridge slowly up this magazine tube. Now one of the nice side effects of this is there's no spring. This isn't a spring-loaded magazine, it's a manually operated magazine. Think of it as like an, an, an elevator or a... Uh, conveyor belt, where each time you operate the lever, you're moving the whole system forward by one increment. So that means there isn't a magazine spring to go bad. That's kind of cool. The downside is it means that when you load this thing, you, it's, it's like loading a conveyor belt. You're putting one cartridge in each position all the way down this magazine tube because you start, in order to load it, you actually start at the butt right here. We have a loading gate that you open and then you slide a cartridge in, just one, and then you have to operate the lever and that rotates the follower which pulls that one cartridge one position up the magazine. Then you put in another cartridge, run the lever again, put in another. You repeat this on a new model gun like this. You would repeat that process 28 times or 26 times and you would end up with one cartridge right here at the top of the magazine, the whole stack of the magazine full and one ready to shoot. Now, again, the, the conveyor belt analogy works really well here because let's say we shoot a round. Chamber it, we fire the round, we open the action, we've now ejected a cartridge. Everything in the magazine tube moves up one position and this means at the very end of the magazine, right back here, we now have one empty space in the magazine. Let's say we shoot three more rounds. So now we've got 
four empty uh, increments, four empty spaces at the back of the magazine. If after four rounds we now have a, a moment, we can do some loading. In order to load the action, we have to put one in and then cycle the lever, which means we're going to spit a live round out unless we actually shoot it at the same time. And we've now put one round in this last increment in the magazine. We still have three empty spaces ahead of it. So if we loaded, if we, we load it full, and then we fire four rounds, and then we load one, you're going to have, what, 24 more shots, and then you're going to have three empty spaces in the magazine, and then you're going to get to that one last cartridge you loaded. So because there is no spring, cartridges don't make up, they don't take up empty space. Uh, they can't advance on their own. So if you wanted to fire one round out of the magazine, you have to load it in the buttstock, cycle the lever 26 times, and then the one cartridge has advanced all the way up. Now that was a real problem. Uh, that was certainly something that the Army took issue with, um, and it's just kind of a pain for everybody. So one of the other improvements with the new model over the old model of Evans is he changed this mechanism so that when I open this, I can open it all the way, like so, without rotating the follower. This is just far enough that it will have extracted the empty case. It won't really eject it because there is no ejector in the Evans. Instead, it's just the, uh, the bottom corner of this follower that when I open it all the way, right there, that follower turns and it kicks the empty case out. Not very forcefully, but it does work. Well, if I want to single load this, I can, but I don't have an ejector. So I'm going to have to kind of shake out the, the empty cartridge and then I can single load a cartridge right here without having moved the magazine follower because it's only that last little bit of action of the lever that cycles the magazine. So I can open to here and I haven't moved the magazine until that last bit. That allows me to single load the action which would definitely be a convenience. What you would so a couple other features here we can take a look at. This is the exposed portion of the hammer, so it does allow you to tell if the gun is cocked or not, and when you fire it, that hammer does drop, like so. We also have this little thing, lever, button, whatever you want to call it. That is a manual lock for the lever. So to use that, what we do is pull the action, pull the hammer back just slightly, and there's a notch in the hammer here. In fact, you can see it when I pull it back farther. So you've got this notch. What you do is line it up with that button, push the button in, and that prevents you from opening the lever. So if you were carrying this, say, in a saddlebag scabbard, you could lock the action with that button to ensure that it didn't bounce open when, you, when the horse was running, or you didn't accidentally bump it, open the action, cartridges fall out, dirt gets in, anything like that. The markings on an Evan are right here on the top of the barrel. Now on this particular example they're really heavily worn and it's really tough to make them out. However, you can just see there uh, Evans Repeating Rifle Company, Mechanicsburg, Maine, patent and a patent number. So that, that's what you've got for markings. The old model rifles were serialized, the new model rifles, interestingly, were not. So there is no serial number on, an, on a new pattern Evans to reference. The so the rear sight here reminds me of, actually kind of of a label rifle, although it predated that. Um, it's a pretty simple, basic stair step tile of, style of sight. You've got four increments here. This is one, two, three, and 400 yards. And then you can also move this slider. Uh, this one is stuck in place, but it'd be easy enough to free up. Um, you've got increments on this center ladder that go up to 1,100 yards. So you can also move the sight to one of those, lift it up like that if you want to shoot at ridiculously optimistically long ranges with your, your basically oversized pistol cartridge. A quick note on models. The old model Evans, and again there were only like 500 of those made, do not have any wood on the bottom of the stock. The there is a transitional model, which I've kind of overlooked here so far, which has features of both old and new. The transitional guns still use the Evans short cartridge, so they will not have this dust cover on the action. They will, however, have a two-piece stock like this. Um, and I think something like 1,000 to 1,500 of the transitional guns were made. 
Then you get the, the, the much more common version, which is this, the new model, where you will see that it has a dust cover. You, if you look at the two side by side, you'll of course see that the ejection port on the new model is substantially longer than that of the old and the transitional. That's because it had to be big enough to eject the longer, uh, the new pattern longer cartridge. So dust cover, the ejection port, those two things show you the, uh, or indicate the new model Evans. If you look at a transitional and a new, you'll also notice that the hammer style is different. Uh, the, the old and the transitional guns have a hammer that actually is, uh, acts this direction. It lifts out this way, where this one is a linear instead of a rotating hammer. So one last interesting tidbit on the Evans. Um, this comes from uh, some cowboy action shooters who have taken the, the time to really learn these rifles and hand load for them and shoot them in cowboy action competition. Interestingly, the bores, as far as we can tell, always tend to slug out at uh, 0 .430 inch. So 429, 430, which is typical of kind of what you would expect for a 44 caliber. However, the original ammunition, if you measure the bullet diameter, the original bullets are 0.419 inch, which is substantially undersized. Now, I didn't see any reference to anybody who had actually pulled one of the original bullets to look at its construction. Uh, it may be that those were a hollow based bullet and the base really would expand uh, that 11 thousandths of an inch to fill the rifling. Uh, it was also supposed that this might have been uh, something anticipated, basically a byproduct of the high capacity of the rifle, that Evans was anticipating that you would be shooting a lot, and thus you would have a lot of black powder fouling in the gun, and this extra deep rifling may have been a way uh, to allow the gun to continue to function effectively with a lot of black powder fouling in the barrel. Uh, if you gave it a lot of rifling depth to accumulate in, you would get that many more shots off before it would start to affect your chamber pressure. Whether that's actually the intent or not, I really don't know. Um, that's one of those still sort of mysteries out there about the Evans. One that I found here that I was not expecting to see was a Roper revolving shotgun. Now it wasn't all that long ago actually that I did a video on a different second Roper um, that last video, the gun was, it was kind of a mess. It was missing some parts, had some broken pieces, and I didn't think I would have the chance to see a complete one for a long time. So I figured I'd take advantage of the broken one. Well, lo and behold, here I have a complete and functioning one. And what's really cool is that it has a handful of original Roper cartridge cases with it. And those are a very interesting and important element of the gun. So uh, this, this, Shotgun was invented by a man named Sylvester Roper. He patented it in 1866. They went into production in 1867. He's typically not really well known today. Uh, he did actually collaborate with Christopher Spencer, and the two of them working together got a patent for the world's first pump action shotgun in 1882. But what Roper is much better known for in general is actually his work with motorcycles. He was inducted into the US Motorcycle Hall of Fame a few years ago. Uh, he actually died in his 70s while riding a steam-powered velocipede. Uh, you know, cool way to go out, by the way. Uh, classy. At any rate, his revolving shotgun is a really interesting gun. It's totally different from probably anything else you've seen in a very long time. So why don't I go ahead and bring the camera back here. Let me show you not just how this works, but because I have these cases, I can actually demonstrate the loading and firing and unloading processes. All right, at a basic level, the Roper is, is a four round rotating magazine. These were made in 12 and 16 gauge. This particular one is 12 gauge. And what makes it, first, the first thing that's unusual about it is that it is actually an open bolt firing, manually operated shotgun. So what we have here is the bolt. When I cock the hammer, which by the way has a very long stroke, the bolt head comes back and you heard a metallic click in here. This is actually under spring tension, and it rotated one position at the final bit of the hammer cocking. So we now have the bolt extending backwards out of the gun. What we would do is we would have one of these shells sitting in here. When you pull the trigger, this one's a little bit finicky. When you pull the trigger, the bolt drops. It's going to pick up that shell that's sitting on that magazine tray 
It's going to run it all the way forward. The bolt then locks in place, so you can only pushing on the bolt won't open it up. You have to pull the hammer in order to unlock the toggle inside here. Um, this is chambered, and the last bit of travel of the hammer throws the firing pin forward and fires the shell. You can then cock the gun again. It has an extractor right there at the front of the bolt. It'll pull that case out, leave it in the gun in that position on the magazine, and then rotate to the next shell. So I have this loading gate open so that you can see what's going on. What you would actually do is load the gun and then close the gate, and you'd keep it closed so that the entire action of the gun was sealed up and wouldn't get dirty. Then to unload the gun, well, let me show you the loading process first, because unloading is exactly the opposite of loading. So to load the gun, I start with the bolt closed, and I need to open the bolt before I get it all the way back, because remember, when the bolt fully clicks back, that's when this follower rotates. So I pull it most of the way back like this, and then I take one of my cartridges, and I drop it in the magazine, and then I click the, the hammer all the way back. What that does is rotates the follower one position, so now I have a, theoretically, loaded cartridge sitting in this position in the magazine. Yeah. All right, now I just repeat this process a couple more times. This one is a little bit finicky with the magazine, so close the bolt all the way, open it up, drop my shell, in, make sure it's all the way back. There we go, now I have two shells in there. Now I drop the bolt, pull it back, drop number three in. There we go. I'm, I'm only going to use three here. Now, oh, if we look there, now I have cocked the hammer and I have what is hypothetically a live shell in place, ready to fire. Now, I would be doing this with the dust cover closed. Nothing here has to be open for the gun to actually work. Now, I'll leave it open so that you can see what's happening. This Now, when I pull the trigger, the shell gets pushed forward, all the way forward. Right here, the bolt is fully in battery and locked. And then the last bit of travel of the hammer hits the firing pin and fires this shell. Boom, gun fires. Now, I'm ready to go again, so I cock the hammer back that, in theory, if our extractor was not 150 years old, pulls that case out. You saw the magazine rotated again, so we now have an empty shell down here in this compartment. We have another live shell here. You can repeat this process four times, so if you load four live shells, you can then fire four in a row, and then at that point you're left with an empty gun that has four fired cases in it. Once, once you're at that point, okay, you fired four rounds, the gun's been closed, now you're ready to reload, what you do is pop the cover open and just flip the gun upside down and repeat the process. Let's see, how many do I have in here? So I have one more loaded chamber. There it is. Flip it over upside down. I pull out my empty cases. The gun is now empty and ready to reload. Now let's take a closer look at these cases. These are steel. Frankly, this is very similar to what the very first Gatling guns used. This is a re basically a reusable, hand-loaded cartridge case. So as I said, it's steel. You would actually set a percussion cap in the back here. The gun came with a little tool for setting those. Uh, the manual recommends Berdan caps as being the best suited. You would put in powder, put in your shot, buckshot, birdshot, a single slug, whatever you plan to fire, put on some uh, something to seal it, uh, the manual actually says after you put the primer in, you should put on a little bit of tallow to make it waterproof and, and make sure the primer doesn't come out. Uh, or I should say percussion cap rather than primer. Uh, and you could have as many of these as you wanted. Uh, you know, that allows you to reload them. Uh, this one actually still has a fired primer in it. The manual also mentions that you should, uh, as quickly as possible after you're done shooting, you make sure to pop the percussion caps out of these. So it says if they start to corrode at all, um, it will become very difficult to get them out, which makes sense, um, given that it's a steel cartridge case. So this is a, an early predecessor to the, the brass metallic case. Now in 1867, when these guns were being made, there were uh, more advanced 
cartridges on the market. If you think about it, the, uh, the 1860 Henry was on the market and the 1866 improvement on it, the Winchester 1866, had recently been uh, released to the public. Um, but for shotguns, there weren't quite as many modern options and the Roper you know, wasn't that bad of a, uh, a gun at the time. Definitely had an advantage over, say, you know, two-shot double guns. Uh, they were moderately successful, um, never made a huge dent in the market though, and uh, that leads them to be quite rare today. All right, now that we've seen this work, I want to point out a couple specific elements of the gun and why it works. Yep. This is the firing pin, and I will show you that. Is, that's more easy to point out by disassembling the gun. To do that, we have two screws down here. This one is actually just a set screw, and to take the front half of the gun off, I take this set screw and I actually screw it in deeper, like that. And then the whole front end of the gun unthreads. So this is just a big hollow cylinder with a barrel in it. It does also have a center hole right there that's a locator for the magazine follower. If we look at the back half of the gun, you can see we have the follower here. When I push the bolt forward, you can see that this is a continuation of that firing pin piece. It comes to right there. We can pull out the follower. It has four very small little cut sear edges that dictate its rotational motion. Um, in this, they're a little bit worn, and every once in a while you have to manually kind of adjust the, the follower to get it to cycle. You probably saw me doing that. And then this is the back end of the gun. So what this system did was ameliorate the problem of a muzzle-loading shotgun by using this cartridge case to fully enclose the, the combustion in the chamber. So if we had a gas seal, it would be up here, the barrel came all the way back to here, and that prevents any significant amount of blow-by. It probably got quite dirty. This is a very thick steel case, and it would almost certainly not obturate well. Um, obturation is the idea of the, the case material expanding under pressure to form a gas seal. You can do that with steel cases. Uh, in fact, there's quite a bit of steel-cased ammunition has been used regularly by militaries, and frankly, a lot of the AK ammo you buy today is steel-cased because that's cheaper to make. Um, a steel case this thick isn't going to be doing very much stretching. Here's our extractor on the bottom of the gun. Interestingly, um, the previous roper that I was looking at on video had an extractor on the top of the bolt instead of the bottom. Well, I'm not sure exactly what significance that has, probably some manufacturing changes over the course of production. Today we're taking a look at a Roper Sporting Arms Company revolving rifle. Now we've previously looked at a Roper revolving shotgun, but there's a little bit more to this story that I wanted to share with you. So uh, there are two names involved with this. One is Sylvester Roper, uh, who's the guy who designed this interesting idea for a four-shot revolving shotgun, which became a revolving rifle as well. Uh, the other is Christopher Spencer. Now, you may recognize Christopher Spencer from the Spencer Lever Action Repeating Rifle, which was adopted and manufactured in pretty large numbers during the Civil War. It was the standard U.S. cavalry carbine for a short time after the war, um, and it is distinctive for being really the first militarily adopted lever action repeating rifle. It's pretty cool. Interestingly, though, Christopher Spencer, the guy who invented it, was never actually a stockholder in the Spencer, Spencer Arms Company. So when the Civil War ended, and of course at the same time orders for the Spencer rifle ended, um, it was substantially outclassed by the Henry and the 1866 Winchester and obsolete by the end of the Civil War. Well, when that happened, he was kind of left in the lurch. He'd been an employee of basically his own company, but he had no actual stockholding investment in it. So they fired him and he was kind of out on his own. So what he did was hook up with Sylvester Roper, who was interested in, in having him join Roper's team, and Roper wanted to manufacture these shotguns. Now, Roper's first two guns, his prototypes, were actually rifles, not shotguns. But 
what they ended up putting into production in their Amherst factory was a four-shot, 16-gauge shotgun. And it's a unique firearm in that it's an open bolt, manually operated gun, which is unusual. We'll take a look at exactly how it works in a moment. And it also uses its own, like, custom self-contained cartridges. So this was designed a little bit before we actually had, like, standardized shot shells. Um, but it was designed after people were well aware of the concept of the self-contained cartridge, and, you know, people knew how to do that, and knew of its advantages over muzzle-loading. And the Roper is one of these few rifles, or few weapons, right in the middle, that is an intermediate system. It was sold with a number of steel, reusable cartridge cases. And you would prime them with either a percussion cap or a primer, depending on the, the model of the shell, and then load powder and pack shot into it, buckshot, birdshot, nails, whatever you wanted to fire out of the thing. You'd load your own shells, uh, and then put them in the gun, and after you fired them, they'd eject out, and you'd collect them up and reload them again. So it gave you the advantages of a self-contained cartridge. Namely, you had a whole shell, you didn't have to wander around and then, you know, stuff things down the muzzle of the gun when you wanted to shoot. However, all of the shells were totally reusable, and you weren't dependent on having to find fixed ammunition for sale, which in the late 1860s was potentially a problem. Um, not everywhere was going to have it, and who knows if they'd have the exact type that you needed. So that was the, the advantage of the Roper system. The open bolt thing was kind of a disadvantage. Uh, the company was around for about two years. They were making guns. They made about 1,300 of these 16-gauge uh, shotguns. In 1868, they uh, actually recalled they'd only started making them, uh, or only started selling them fairly recently. Uh, it took them a while to get up into production. But in 1868, they recalled the ones that were out there. They retrofitted them with an adjustable choke. Uh, that Roper had invented, which was a pretty cool thing. We still use that sort of device today. And they also introduced a 12-gauge model. They ended up making about 250 of the 12-gauges. And these things were really expensive guns. The lowest end one you could buy would cost you $60, which was a ton of money in 1868. And for a nice, fancy set, it's a hundred bucks for the gun with some cartridges. This, combined with the open bolt style of action, led to really not very many people buying the guns, because they're ludicrously expensive. And as a result, by late 1868, the company president had had enough. He was like, yeah, this isn't working, I'm tired of losing money, I'm gonna sell this whole endeavor. I'm out. And at that point, Spencer kind of still needed something to do, and he thought there was potential in the gun, so he scraped up enough money to buy the company himself. And it became the Spencer Sporting Arms Company and he moved it to Hartford, Connecticut, and set up production again. He actually got a guy named Billings uh, to join him as part of the, the company management team, or engineering team. Um, and Billings had a lot of really valuable experience with tooling and, and uh, manufacturing technology. So that was a boon to Spencer and his endeavor. When Spencer set up his company, uh, they had a bunch of, of leftover 16-gauge shotguns, so they didn't manufacture any of those. But they did man manufacture new 12-gauge guns, and they also added a rifle to the company catalog. A 40 caliber rifle that worked on exactly the same principle. You got reusable steel cartridge cases that you would hand load. Um, and these were available as either five or six shot guns, because of course 40 caliber is a little smaller in diameter, so you can fit more of them into this receiver section. And if you wanted to be really fancy, you could get a package deal, uh, a combination where you got one back end of the gun, and then you got a front end that was a rifle, and you got a second front end that was a shotgun. Pretty cool. Well, Spencer's company made about 600 of these, and this won't probably come as a huge shock. They were still... they were a little less expensive than before, but they were still very expensive guns. Forty-five, fifty-five, sixty-five dollars per gun uh, in that range. And so they still weren't being purchased by very many people. And uh, Spencer's company had to take up, like, some outside contracting work just to stay afloat. So they started doing contract drop forging, and made a ton of money at it. Discovered that this was a far more lucrative thing to be doing than making guns. So they, like, got all the stockholders together and had a quick little session, and um, the outcome was the Spencer and Billings Company, which uh, did outsourced forging work. And um, they diversified quite a lot, and it became pretty successful. Spencer himself uh, would go on to invent the automatic screw machine, which 
some documentation, some literature uh, describes as like a machine for making screws. That's not the case. The automatic screw machine is a, a pretty cool piece of like lathe-like uh, machine tool technology that you can use to manufacture almost anything, and is widely used to this day, and is, was a major part of the development of the Industrial Revolution in the United States. And its invention uh, brought Spencer a small fortune by the end of his life. He did quite well off of that. He diversified into other work, into uh, sewing machine stuff, and all sorts of different mechanical ventures. He was really quite the inventive genius. And he would ultimately come back in 1880 and partner up again with Sylvester Roper to invent the pump-action shotgun, uh, which didn't end up selling very well either. He kinda, his best gun work was his very first gun work with the Spencer lever-action rifle. But he went on to have a very successful and happy career doing other machine tool-oriented work. So a, a happy story of a successful gun designer. Too many of these guys spend way too many years of their life laboring on a design that is ultimately a failure. So it's nice to have one that turns out well for a change. Anyway, uh, let's take a closer look at this gun, because it really is a cool, interesting, and unusual action. I can already hear you asking how on earth a manually operated open bolt gun is supposed to actually work, and what's well, actually simpler than you might think, as well as our most open bolt guns. Uh, we have a loading cover here, and by opening that you can get a better view of what's going on in the gun. This is the bolt, and this isn't really a hammer, although it looks like a hammer. It's actually more of a cocking lever. So I'm going to cock this all the way back, and lock it open. And at this point we would have a cartridge sitting in this channel of the magazine. When I pull the trigger, this bolt is going to go all the way forward. It's going to load that cartridge into the chamber, lock. There's a toggle inside here that locks the bolt forward, and then fire. The last motion forward uh, strikes the firing pin right here, and actually fires the gun. So there it goes, locks, and bang, fires. Then, after you've fired one round, you recock the action, and the last thing it does when it locks open is pop. I don't know if you can see it, but this is a spring-loaded magazine that rotates or indexes one position every time you open the hammer all the way, or open the bolt all the way. So for rapid fire, all you have to do is cock this open and pull the trigger, bang, it fires, cock it, bang, it fires, cock it, bang, it fires literally that quickly. Uh, once you have emptied the magazine, fired all the cartridges, then what you do is tip the rifle upside down and basically cycle through the magazine again, dropping the now empty cartridges uh, out of the magazine. I should say, every time after you've fired, what it does is extract the empty cartridge until you hit that point where the magazine rotates, which pops the cartridge out of the extractor in the bolt face and lines up the next cartridge to use. So the downside to this is, of course, that firing from an open bolt means you've got a lot of stuff going on and moving before the gun actually fires, um, and thus you have a lot of opportunity for your aim to wobble off of target. There was a solution to that presented uh, by the company in their company literature, and that was the safety notch. So if you want to make a more precise shot, what you would do is cock the thing open, and then you can let it down, release the trigger, and it will drop to either the firing notch, or depending on where you release the trigger, the safety notch right here, which is just shy of firing. And then you cock it back to that point and pull the trigger here. You have a nice light crisp trigger pull. You have a much faster lock time because things aren't really moving. Um, you know, the bolt's going from here to there. Uh, much, much better firing solution that way. Although even that option wasn't enough to uh, get to spur sales of this gun, largely I think because of the price. These were made in a number of different configurations. This particular one happens to have a very heavy octagon profile barrel. It's set up with both a barrel mounted sight and a flip up aperture sight. That would be for longer range shooting. And it's got a nice fancy hooded folding post in the front.
You may not have heard of Merwin and Hulbert. They never achieved all that much widespread popularity, despite the fact that they are arguably the best revolver of the Frontier era. So I have four different versions here, because with the, the cool variety that are, are available in this auction, I'm able to pick out uh, a number of different models to show the evolution of the design. Now the one thing I'm not going to get into in this are the non-army style guns that Merwin and Hulbert made. They did have a whole line of 38 caliber small revolvers and we're not even going to get into those. So let me start with a little bit of basic background. Uh, Joseph Merwin was the man behind these guns. The company was Mer Merwin and Hulbert. Well, the Hulbert brothers were basically his financial backing. Uh, they were apparently quite astute businessmen. They were quite good at what they did. Um, Merwin was the gun designer. You may recognize him from the Merwin and Bray revolvers, uh, Civil War era. Well, he, he kept tinkering about with various different things. In 1868, he and the Hulbert brothers formed this conglomerate company, Merwin, Hulbert, and Company. Um, they did an, a bunch of investing, uh, thanks, I'm sure, to the, the uh, know-how of the Hulberts. And by the time these guns were in production, the company actually was fairly well diversified. They, they had invested $100,000 in the Evans Rifle Company. The Evans, as you may recall, is this really kind of neat lever action that has a, uh, like a 32 or 40 round magazine in the butt stock. Um, they also owned a 50% interest in Hopkins and Allen, a, a very significant manufacturing company. And it was in fact Hopkins and Allen that manufactured these guns for Merwin and Hulbert. Now, Merwin, one of the, the basic design criteria that he had in mind when he devised these guns was strength and quality. Um, in particular, this, these were made around the time that reloading gear was actually becoming commonly available. And Merwin was legitimately so concerned that people would overload cartridges and, and he wanted to make his gun strong enough that there wouldn't be any liability from them blowing up because of overpowered hand loads. Our teeth. So we'll see a number of, of elements of that coming into his design. Uh, in fact, why don't I bring the camera back here? Let's just dive right into what is arguably the best cowboy revolver ever. All right, I sort of lied. We're actually going to start with this one. This is a very early first model Frontier revolver, so that's a good place to start. Now, I said Frontier uh, because that was, you can tell, the, uh, the flat bottomed grip here is indicative of the Frontier model from Merwin and Hulbert. This has a 7 inch barrel, which was a standard barrel length for them, and it is single action, so we can tell that by the fact that the trigger uh, is a very, has a very short travel to it. Single action was typical of the time, although Merwin and Hulbert would come out with some double action guns. We'll see those in a minute. In order to load the gun, you put it at half cock, and we have a loading gate right here that pulls straight down, and then load one at a time, loading it comes back up. So there are three main mechanical elements that really make the Merwin stand out from its competitors. So let's take a look at those. To unload the gun, you push this stud back and you can then rotate the barrel assembly 90 degrees on, on its center axis pin. When you pull the, the assembly forward, the cylinder comes with it, all six cases are extracted simultaneously. So this is as fast to unload as a top brake revolver although it still requires loading through the gate here. Now, we need to take a little bit of a closer look at this to see how it works, because you may notice there's no uh, extractor star. So how do the cases come out? Well, the cases, the, the bit of the rim is actually lodged underneath this flange on the back of the frame. So when I put this all the way down, you can see that the cylinder is tight up there. That's why the gun has to be loaded through this loading gate. So when you load cartridges here, the rim sits on top of that flange. You can see if I go to open it here, that little flange right there, that acts as our extractor. Now, if you were watching closely when I opened this, you will notice that the second main mechanical uh, feature of the Merwin. There is a cam in the access pin so that this last bit of travel when I'm rotating the barrel open pulls the cylinder forward just slightly. That is designed to be primary extraction. So the idea is, in particular with early uh, copper cartridges, the cases could often expand enough, they, they would expand but not then contract sufficiently and they'd be very tight in the cylinders. 
if you had something like a single action Colt with an ejector rod, it was hard to get those out because you, all you had was an ejector rod that hammer on the, the back of the case. Well, with the Merwin, you've got this little camming action that pops the seal on the fired cartridges if they're stuck. Then you can pull them out straight. Now the third element is really clever and it's something that you can't necessarily see on video. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a, a combination of live ammo and empty cases to demonstrate with, but what I can tell you is that the length of this travel is actually less than the overall length of a loaded cartridge. Um, I should backtrack and say these very first guns were offered in 44 Merwin and Hulbert, which was pretty similar to 44 Russian, but a little bit longer. If you had a loaded case, let's say you, you loaded six rounds and you fired well, three of them, when you opened this up, the empty brass was short enough that it would fall out. The intact loaded cartridges were long enough that they would not. The rim would stay stuck under here, and the nose of the bullet would remain just slightly inside the cylinder. The upshot of this is if you fired three rounds and wanted to top off the gun, when you pop it open, your three empty cases fall out, your three live rounds stay in the gun. Really a very clever mechanical system. Now the other thing that doesn't really come across on video is just how Im immaculately manufactured these guns are. Even when they're worn on the outside, and, and this one frankly is a pretty good example, the fit between the axis pin and the barrel assembly is remarkably smooth. So much so that when you open or close it, the mechanical fit creates just a little bit of vacuum. Now this one's a bit worn. I'll demonstrate on one of the later guns. You can really actually get an audio idea of how tight that fit is and how smooth they are. Now the disassembly mechanism remained constant on these guns, so I'll demonstrate that with this one as well. Um, the one thing that did change, this is a first model Frontier, and one of the distinguishing features of that is it has this little tiny detent on this takedown lever. So this lever allows us to pull the barrel off. What I do is open it up, and then I have to push in that detent and then push this lever down. And then the barrel and the cylinder pop right off. No tools required. So cylinder is, is very simple. We've pretty much already seen that. So this angle right here is the camming surface that is there to break cartridges free. And then there's a cut here on the end of the axis pin. That cut mates up with this barrel wedge to ensure that the barrel is solidly locked into the gun. So when the barrel's in place, you can see that that cutout is directly in line with the barrel wedge. So that's a strengthening feature. All right, let's go ahead and move on to a second model, which is, has a number of differences to it. You'll see this is still an open-topped gun. This is a second model of Merwin and Hulbert. It is also in a pocket army instead of a frontier. The, the obvious visual difference, the frontier has the flat-bottomed grip. The pocket army has a bird's head with um, well, some books call it a crested bird's head with this extra finger loop. Some people call this a skull crusher grip for hitting folks on the head with. I'm not sure that was, it may or may not have been the original intent. At any rate, uh, with this bird's head grip, this model is referred to as a pocket army, despite the fact that it really isn't a pocket gun so much, except in comparison to the much larger Frontier. This has a three and a half inch barrel. That was also, that was the other standard barrel length for Merwin and Halbert. Now, the distinction with the second model is actually fairly subtle. General mechanics work the same way. Put the gun at half cock and pop this open, and we have all the same mechanical features. The recoil bolt has been improved, and there's no longer an open uh, plate down here that you have to, to get into to do some of the maintenance on the gun. Uh, I should show you that. Here on the first model, this is a removable plate. Here on the second model, it's not, it's a solid frame. Now one of the other changes that the second model made, the first model guns were all offered in 44 Merwin and Hulbert, which is of course impossible to get today. Yeah, I'm sure you could hand load it, but with the second model, they started offering these in 4440, or as it's marked here, caliber 1873 Winchester. Um, that made the guns uh, gave them a wider market because the, the 4440 cartridge was very popular and easily accessible everywhere. So 
The other thing that I want to point out with this one, obviously the outside is not in as good of condition, but it is engraved. And in fact, you'll notice if you start keeping your eyes out for a lot of Merwin and Halberts that there seem to be a remarkable number of engraved examples. There's good reason for that. The company actually came up with an engraving method that was largely mechanical. It involved basically pin punches instead of a handheld engraving tool. That allowed them to offer en engraved guns from the factory at a very reasonable price point. If you were simply you know, a reasonably middle class sort of person who wanted a fancy gun, you could afford an engraved Merwin and Hulbert. If you wanted an engraved example of a Colt or a Remington, well that was all hand done work and that was much more expensive. So for that reason you'll find a lot of engraved Merwins out there from people who simply wanted to have, they appreciated the fact that they had the best mechanical revolver on the market and they wanted it to be one of the best looking ones as well. So enough of the second model here, let's move on to the third model. So we have two examples here of the third model of Merwin and Hulbert. The top one here is a Frontier. There will be a quiz at the end I suppose. The Frontier has the flat grip. The second one has the bird's head grip which would make it a pocket army model. Um, what's really distinctive about the third model is that they finally introduced a top strap. So the barrel wedge up here is gone. That's no longer necessary because now the barrel is held in place down here and up at the top. That being said, it still retains the same mechanism. Put the gun at half cock, pull this back, and it opens to extract and eject. Now this particular example is also in 4440 caliber. It has this very frightened looking deer on it. Some of the engraving, in fact the, the engraving patterns vary quite a bit and some of them are a bit entertaining. Um, this again has a three inch barrel. I think you could make a very substantial argument that this gun, this exact model, would have been the best firearm in the Old West. It's got the strength of a, uh, a solid frame revolver. It's got the reloading, ejecting and reloading speed of the fastest top brake guns. Um, has a very convenient short barrel. This is really the epitome of the ideal Old West gunfighter's pistol. Now we do also have this version. The clever eyed viewer will have noticed that there is something different about the trigger here. This is a double action version of the Merwin and Halbert. I mentioned that they did make these. Well this is a third model double action Frontier. Uh, now I believe this one, yes, this is also in caliber 4440. Again that's marked Winchester 1873 because that's uh, when the cartridge came out and how it was often designated. Uh, all right, I had mentioned, uh, I had kind of hyped the quality of the machine fit between the barrel and the access pin and this is the gun that I want to demonstrate it to you with. Now if you look at this gun closely, frankly the finish is mm, it's not in real good shape. That's an awfully brown cylinder. There's a lot of surface pitting, the nickels coming off. You would think this is not a particularly well cared for gun and yet internally it is still magnificent. At least the action is. So uh, being double action, I cock the hammer all the way back to, to free it up to reload. Push this in, pull this back and what I'm going to do is actually point the barrel down and there is enough of a vacuum created by the mechanical fit that it actually pulls the barrel back under vacuum until it's, that vacuum slowly leaks out and it comes all the way forward. So there we have an, a basic introduction to the 44 caliber Merwin and Hulbert. There are a lot of other guns that the company made over the course of its business lifespan, uh, but that lifespan was frankly pretty short. The company was out of business by 1880 or 1881. This was largely due actually to the death of Joseph Merwin in 1879. Um, and the company was in pretty dire financial straits at that point for reasons that had nothing to do with the quality of its guns. Unfortunately, that $100,000 in the Evans Rifle Company had been a bad idea because the Evans failed to be a commercial success. Uh, and there were three major shipments of Merwin and Hulbert revolvers to Russia that ultimately were never paid for. Um, the company was having some issues. It was These guns were tested by the US military, which found all of the, the strengths that I've gone over with you, but the army didn't think that they were a, enough of an improvement over the 1873 Colt to be worth changing over to. Uh, and that may have been as much politics as mechanics, but ultimately didn't make a difference to Merwin because the army didn't adopt his guns. 
what we have here today are a pair of Remington split breech carbines. We have a first pattern in the back, and a second pattern in the front. And this is the gun that would, in its next evolution, become the Remington rolling block, which would be a somewhat uh, underappreciated mainstay of worldwide military forces for a couple of decades towards the end of the 1800s. This is arguably the best, or the rolling block that would follow this, is arguably the best single-shot military rifle that was ever developed. It was simple, it was reliable, it was durable, it was effective, it was accurate, and it would see service all the way through World War I. However, at its very beginnings, it was this, the split breech carbine. And we'll look at these in detail in a moment, and I'll show you exactly why, where that split breech name comes from. But the origin of this is interestingly actually two guys who apparently came up with basically the same idea at the same time. The first one was a guy named Leonard Geiger, Geiger uh, who patented some, the, some of this concept, um, and then never actually put it into practice. Uh, this would be the early 1860s that he did this. Never produced the guns, as far as we can tell, and he ended up coming to an agreement with a business partner uh, who he relinquished the patent rights to. That guy didn't do anything either. His name was Charles Alger. Um, and it probably wouldn't have gone anywhere, except for the fact that a man named Joseph Ryder, who was a, uh, one of the engineers for the Remington Company, came up with a very similar idea and patented it, patented some slightly different aspects of it. Well, Remington saw this as a particularly profitable, they thought this had some potential as a military arm. And when they went to start producing it, they discovered Geiger's patent. And well, it wasn't the very first thing they did. They, after a year or two, they realized that there was a potential legal problem here. Um, because there was overlap between the two designs, so they came to an agreement with Geiger and um, Alger to actually pay a license, a royalty, on Geiger's patent. So uh, Geiger and Alger ended up making a nice amount of money on their patent, despite never actually manufacturing it, so it worked out well for them. Uh, Remington, of course, turned this into a tremendously popular rifle, so it worked out well for them. Kind of worked out well for everybody involved. Now. Uh, the initial production of these guns has a cool story to it as well. Uh, during the Civil War, Remington was really uh, working at full capacity, making especially revolvers. They also took a contract to make uh, standard pattern rifles for the federal government. They didn't have excess production capacity to try and put into a potential new weapon like this. However, the U.S., the Ordnance Department, kind of had a standing policy that it was willing to buy like a thousand examples of pretty much any breech-loading carbine mechanism that looked like it was reasonably practical. So in 1864, Remington took one of these guns, one of, well, a Remington-made prototype, uh, to Washington to demonstrate to the Ordnance Department. And the demonstration went fairly well, and they happened to run into a guy there by the name of Samuel Norris, or uh, Morris. Morris would end up being pretty heavily involved in Remington, but at this point his involvement was that he thought this carbine had potential, and, and he was eager to try and make some deals, and Remington was kind of had more work than they could deal with. And the two came to this agreement that Norris uh, would basically act as a rem an, an agent for Remington. And if he could get a contract and get production and just, if he could deal with it, uh, Remington would be happy to give him a royalty on the, the you know, a, a portion of the contract, portion of the profits. And hey, that meant if Remington could get a contract for their guns, great, uh, they'll make some money on it, but they're not willing to try and deal with all of the hassle of, of getting production. They don't have room to do it themselves. So Norris managed to arrange a contract from the federal government for a thousand uh, small frame the first pattern Remington split breech carbines. These were in 44 rimfire caliber. And well, the trick was he had to then find someone who could make them. He ended up finding the Savage Revolving Firearms Company. We've done some videos on uh, Savage Revolvers and Savage Revolving Rifles. They had some manufacturing capacity and they were willing to take on a project like this. With a caveat, they weren't willing to do a thousand guns. They needed a bigger order in order to make it worth their while. They needed, they, they wouldn't do this unless they got an order for 10,000. So 
Norris took a substantial risk here, and he put in an order for 10,000 split-breech carbines with the Savage Firearms Company, despite the fact that he only had a contract to make a thousand for the government. He was, he was enough of a believer in the system, he thought it was a good enough gun, that he figured either the government would order more, or someone would be willing to pay for these guns, and he was willing to risk a substantial amount of his own capital uh, to make this happen. He thought it would be worthwhile. And as it turns out, he was right. Um, the, in, in January of 64, or January of 65, the federal government was willing to up the contract for these 44 caliber Remingtons to 5,000 guns, so that was a big help, um, because the federal cavalry was having trouble procuring enough guns that were good and reliable. Uh, at the same time, or actually slightly earlier, in September of 64, the Union decided to standardize on the 5650 Spencer cartridge for all of its cartridge firing breech loading rifles. They had a lot of Spencers, and they were getting enough of these new various types of breech loading carbines in different calibers with, I mean, totally different types of ammunition sometimes. If you look at things like the Maynard cartridge. Uh, that they wanted to standardize it. So when they standardized on the 5650, which was the Spencer cartridge, they came back very quickly thereafter, the next month, October of 64, and they offered Norris and Remington a contract for 15,000 of these split breech guns in 50 caliber, 5650. Uh, so Norris's bet paid off. Um, in fact, he managed to sell 20,000 of the guns from an initial order of 1,000, did great, he would go on to have a, a, a bright future with, uh, in cooperation with Remington. The only real downside here is none of these guns were actually delivered in time to take part in the Civil War. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the, 56, the 50 caliber guns, the deliveries didn't finish until like May of, 19, of 1866, so well after the war was over. Uh, Remington was one of, well, and Savage and Norris, were one of the lucky uh, contractors to the, the Union in that they were actually allowed to complete this contract even after the war ended. Most of the Union's arms contracts were simply cancelled uh, when, when peace was reached. They didn't need any more guns, they had plenty to begin with. Now that the war was over, they didn't have to maintain, you know, keep buying new stuff. Most of these contractors just, that's it, were cancelling it. And some of these guys got really kind of left in the lurch financially. Well, Remington, Savage, and Norris were lucky in that they their contract was allowed to be fulfilled. The design of these two carbines is really identical mechanically. However, in 44 caliber they were a little bit smaller than in 56 or 5650. Which by the way, that's a 56 caliber base of the cartridge, which tapers to 50 caliber at the bullet. Um, that's what that nomenclature is. So the 50, 50 caliber gun had to be just dimensionally larger in order to fit the larger cartridge, and that's the difference between these two. Um, the Savage factory manufactured all 5,000 of these first pattern small frame guns, and then they retooled as necessary to make the larger pattern 50 caliber guns and made the whole contract of 15,000 of these. So a grand total of 20,000 manufactured between the two. So the way this works is you have a hammer, and you have a breech block, and the breech block rotates on this pin, pivots open, and gives you access to the chamber right here. So you would put in a cartridge, and then you would close the breech block, and then what's clever about this system is that when the hammer falls, it actually locks the breech block and prevents it from rotating. So as soon as that starts moving, there are two interlocking, basically interlocking round uh, surfaces inside here, the hammer locks the breech, and so it fires. Uh, doesn't have any, uh, can't open until you recock the hammer, which then unlocks the breech. It's a very clever system. It's a simple system. Um, worked well. Worked quite well. Um, these were originally relatively low power rimfire cartridges, and the reason for the split breech name is simply that the hammer is right smack in the center of this breech block. Now that would prove to be fine for 44 and 44 rimfire and 5650 Spencer. It would not be suitable for larger like real rifle caliber cartridges. And so 
after doing these split breech guns, uh, Ryder, Joseph Ryder, uh, Remington's engineer, and the Remington company would go back and they'd redesign this system a bit to make for a solid breech block. And that is what would be officially known as the Remington rolling block, and what would become very popular. Here's the larger of the two, the 50 caliber, which works exactly the same way, just slightly larger parts. You can see there's a little nub on the breech block wheel here, and that acts as the extractor. So when you open this, it's going to do nothing until you get to about there, and then it's going to start to pull the cartridge out, and it pulls it just about a quarter inch out of the chamber. You can then grab it, throw it out, and put in a new cartridge. The firing pin is right there, fixed to the face of the hammer, and there's a little hole in the breech block for it to go through. Of course, these are rimfire cartridges, so the hammer is, or the firing pin is offset at the top of the cartridge. We have some markings here on the tang. Uh, Remington, Remington was located in Ilion, New York. That December 22nd, 1863 patent is, I believe, the Geiger patent uh, that they got permission to use. And then the 1864 patent is Joseph Ryder's patent. When this became the rolling block, uh, a, a, a whole bunch of additional patents would be filed for various features. And on late on Remington rolling blocks, you'll see the list of patent dates on their markings uh, continue to expand. These were uh, U.S. Marshall property firearms, despite the fact that they arrived too late for the Civil War. So they will have uh, the appropriate inspector's cartouches on the stock. Uh, now, if the stocks have been replaced at any point, which isn't all that uncommon, uh, because these would go on to see combat use, we'll talk about that later. Um, if the stocks have been replaced, obviously the cartouches are gone. But on this 50 caliber one, it's pretty cool that they're still there. As is the U.S. stamp on uh, the butt plate. The sights here are pretty typical for this sort of thing. You've got a rear notch for 100 yards, and then you've got a flip-up post which gives you a notch for 300 and a notch for 500. Those are both marked on there, 3 and 5. Ooh, wow, that's tight. There we go. That lifts up. Note that you actually have kind of a buckhorn style of sight picture. There's a rear notch with an opening above it. Front sight is just a basic barley corn style post. Now, I think even the best part of the story is yet to come, uh, and that is what happened to these after they were received into federal government property. Uh, of course, it's 1866, the Civil War is over, they don't need all of these guns, they basically go straight into storage. And then in 1870, the Franco-Prussian War happens. Uh, one little aside here, the Spencer Rifle Company went out of business in 1869. If they had managed, and they're I should say, and they were bought up by Winchester. If they'd managed to squeeze out one more year, they might have actually ended up in a financial position to have Spencer buy out Winchester and substantially change American firearms history because of the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, it didn't go so well for the French. Uh, and in 1870, they found a massive French army surrounded, cut off, and ultimately captured by Prussian forces. And in the process, the French lost literally hundreds of thousands of rifles and became desperate for more small arms. Well, where on earth are they going to get small arms? They, you know, there's only so much that you can tool up and manufacture on your own, uh, especially with the country at war. Well, what about other countries that might have big stockpiles of surplus guns that they would be willing to sell to the French? Well, Here's the United States just a couple years after the end of the Civil War, where the U.S. has manufactured a boatload of guns, and now they're all sitting in storage, and in fact the U.S. government is starting to sell them as surplus. Well, a couple of private companies, in particular one by the name of Schuyler, Hartley, and Graham, started purchasing up large quantities of American surplus firearms and shipping them to France for a really pretty nice profit. Uh, some other guys got into this business. In fact, uh, Hartley would end up buying the Remington Company several decades later, uh, and at this point he was cooperating with Remington. Remington had sold, they'd sold these small frame guns to the government for $17 each, and they'd sold the large frame ones for $23 each. Well, they bought them back, cleaned, stored, and basically unused for $15 each, and then sold them to the French. So Remington made a quite nice profit, along with some of these other surplus dealers, uh, shipping all of this American surplus off to France. There's one particularly fun story where um, a guy named W.W. W. Reynolds, he was uh, delegated to be an agent for Hartley, Schuyler, Hartley, and Graham, 
uh, to take a batch of guns, a large batch of guns, something like 80,000 rifles and carbines, maybe even more than that, I don't remember the exact numbers, to take them over to France, deliver them, take payment, and then come home. You know, you didn't have international wire transfers and PayPal and such in the 1870s. If you want to get paid, well, you have to go there, get some money, like in the form of gold, and then bring it home. So that was his job to do. He managed to get the guns to France, into Paris, and by the time the deal was all closed and finalized, Paris was getting surrounded by the Prussians. Uh, and he managed to make his escape from Paris, I kid you not, in a hot air balloon, with a couple of really close calls when the wind started blowing him over Prussian army encampments. Uh, that right there, by the way, if there are any movie producers watching, the story of that arms sale from the US to France and the subsequent escape by hot air balloon, that would make an awesome movie if done right. I'm just saying. So ultimately what happened to virtually all of these Remington split breech guns is they got shipped over to France. They were not used in the American Civil War, but they did get used in the Franco-Prussian War, especially the ones in 5650. Uh, the French bought a boatload, literally a boatload, of Spencer rifles and carbines in 5650, so they had that ammunition, and most of these guns got pretty well used during that conflict um, as a French substitute for all the chasse that had been lost in, uh, in the campaign. Thanks for watching.